my grandmother in uh in her later years you know she basically as an elder for four decades advanced philanthropy or the love of humanity and as her activities wane, she she closed down the Vincent Astor Foundation in 1997, and and in 1998 was awarded by President Clinton the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and then had a birthday party in 2002, at her hundredth birthday party, uh, which was hosted by David Rockefeller, and then disappeared from the limelight until. Uh, my petition for her guardianship was discovered by the press, leading to front page headlines, disaster for Mrs. Astor. And, you know, my grandmother would really never want to be known as one of America's most famous cases of elder abuse. But nor did she choose in her frail condition to be so compromised, be manipulated, robbed, and isolated. But it, after I took action for my grandmother, I realized her case was far from isolated. There are millions of elder victims today suffering similar injury. And I realized that if my grandmother, Brooke Astor, can be so abused, that elder abuse does not discriminate. Any elder is vulnerable. And I realized that the cost of elder abuse far exceeds any dollar amount. Most costs are irretrievable, some compounded. And I realized to be complacent about elder justice is to be complicit in elder abuse. In fact, our national negligence is a proximate cause of elder abuse. Our silence protects perpetrators, not their victims. Today, Victims of this crime may be strangers. Tomorrow, they may be our loved ones or in the future ourselves. Seniors and society deserve more. When elders lose their sight, it's natural. But when we turn a blind eye to their plight, it's negligent. When seniors lose their voice, it's natural, but when we choose not to voice our concern, it's negligent. When seniors lose their hearing, it's natural, but when we are deaf to their cries for help, it's negligent. And when seniors' capacity is reduced, it's natural, but when their assets are reduced without consent, it's criminal. Kathy Holt, uh, Associate Director at the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Um, I had the pleasure of spending some time with Philip Marshall, and I just want to say to you that he has almost as much energy as Judy Stein. <laughs> Impossible. So today we are a panel of elder justice, and we are recognizing and advocating for elder justice in the context of the healthcare delivery and payment systems. And I will say that we have worked very hard as a panel to make this about making justice happen and not about identifying and, and uh, going backwards with, with the idea of elder justice. So today, we're going to focus specifically on institutional care delivery culture and processes and government regulations and policies as they result as they refer to the various presentations and um, I won't be coming up in between our panelists so I want to give you an overview of what our panel is looking to share with you um, Terry Fulmer we'll be discussing the hospital screenings that should identify individuals who are vulnerable to abuse. Um, Toby Edelman will focus on nursing homes and how they should provide appropriate staffing care and also for staffing care to reduce chemical restraints. I'll be discussing um, home health care and legally covered benefits and how they should be fully accessible 
to individuals with chronic and long-term care conditions. And finally, Sarah will discuss dementia care across all settings and implementing effective behavioral interventions. And Sarah said to me just uh, this morning that based on um, her view of Philip Marshall's video that she has also made some adjustments in, in her presentation today to focus on the things that Philip talked about. And, and we'll um, end this conversation with a discussion with the group and then be revisited, if you will, by Philip Marshall in a final closing video um, in which he calls us all to awareness of the problems and advocacy to, to make, make elder justice um, a right for all of us. So I'm going to turn the program over to the president of the John A. Hartford Foundation, Terry Fulmer. Thank you. Thank you so much to Kathy, to Judy. The Medicare Center is just doing an amazing job. And I was so fired up by this morning's panels and thinking about all the things that we must do now. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And also, I want to thank the previous uh, presenters who have done such a great job getting us all to this point this afternoon. And um, I'm going to uh, um, talk to you today. I am the president of the John A. Hartford Foundation in New York City, very proud to hold that position, hi Mike, and to um, tell you that we have some major initiatives where we're funding a very important elder abuse initiative right now that is going to give us a lot of information for the future ways that we'll make sure that every single setting, whether you have a rich setting or a poor setting, whether you're rural, whether you're urban, you have what you need to get the um, work done that allows you to detect and refer and make a difference in the lives and the quality of life of older people. I always say that the opposite of quality of life is elder abuse and that there's no excuse for it. I speak to you, I'm gonna cough a minute, hang on. <coughs> End of a cold. <coughs> and that'll I'll be done now for the next 30 minutes I know by experience. <laughs> Thank you and excuse me. So, I'm talking to you today as a nurse. I am a nurse. I'm very uh, privileged to be a nurse. And we heard comments earlier on the video about what a privileged space it is to be in that intimate moment with people at their most vulnerable, regardless of setting. And that's my work. And so um, I, I want to tell you how I became so absolutely embedded. And I'm going to set my timer because in passion, I do not want to go long. Um, in, in thinking about my career and how it started, I'd like to give you a little bit of context and say that I began my career in a very wonderful teaching hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, with a lot of smart people around. And what I learned very quickly was that there was a phenomena where we would do the following, save them and scorn them. Save them and scorn them. If you had ventricular tachycardia, a, a lethal arrhythmia, we were very interested. But if you broke that arrhythmia and if you began to moan because you had dementia, we were not interested. We would save you and scorn you. If you had cancer, we were very interested in getting you the right chemotherapy, making sure you got your radiation, but heaven help you if you had a bed sore or if you were incontinent. Those were not important or interesting things. And I knew at that moment that I had found what I was going to focus on for my entire career, which was the eradication of this negligence we heard from uh, Philip, who has done wonderful things with us at the John A. Hartford Foundation. And that I also had found my niche because there was nobody battling me to do this work. There was not a lot of people with sharp elbows saying, I don't want Terry in that space because we've got it covered. No, this was not happening. <laughs> so so um, I thought about um, how I might spend my time and. Something very fortuitous happened the, in Massachusetts in 1978. We passed an elder abuse uh, reporting law. And um, Joyce Clifford and Mitch Ravkin, who were in the city at the time, asked me if I, they said, we know you're interested in older people and in quality of care for them. Would you respond to this law in a meaningful way? And I was too young to know how hard that would be. And I said, yes, of course I would. And so we started our elder abuse team. We developed a screening tool, which is in the literature. And we began to say that every person who comes into this facility has the, the, not only the right, but we have the responsibility to screen, to screen them for any potential signs of elder abuse and neglect. And we did it, and we do it, and we continue to do it. And there are a number of very fine screening instruments in the United States at this point. 
a lot of ways to make sure that all of us are detecting and intervening in cases of elder abuse and neglect, but you can't do it if you don't ask the question. And that question goes unasked so many times. An older person will come into the facility, they might have a bruise, and people will say they're probably on anticoagulants. Or they might be confused, and people say they're old, all older people are confused. That happens every single day, and it's called ageism. And elder abuse and neglect is the, out is the outcome also of rampant ageism in our society, where once you get invisible, as you get older, and once your symptoms are no longer interesting, then we will, um, I'm going to say this, and I love my profession, and I love my work, and I love all the spheres I work in, but older people can become very, very invisible. So I'd like to talk a minute about a case and then go back to the screening uh, and tell you something that happened last month. I go on service as an attending nurse a month each year, uh, two weeks in the winter, two weeks in the summer, and I always think that when I get there um, that things will have been dramatically different because it's been a while, and they're not. So I'll tell you the story about Mr. Lee, who um, came into the facility because he had abdominal pain. He had previously had a colostomy. He began to spike a fever. He had incredible abdominal pain. So he got admitted after being in the emergency room for 72 hours, and that's another topic. <laughs> so he got admitted, and he, was, he came to the floor, and it was clear that he had some cognitive impairment, but he had very clear cognitive capacity. And that's another area, Charlie would be able to speak to it better than most of us, where you have people who know what they want, but the minute we can get a test like a mini mental status exam that's one point off, we immediately say they're, they're not competent, and that's not the case. So this older individual um, had this, this terrible gastric pain, but he knew that he did not want care. His wife had died six months prior, he understood what the consequences would be. He could articulate them. He said, I don't want surgery. I don't want care. I shouldn't have come here. I don't want care. The other thing he was, and this is how I came into the picture, was he was at risk for falling. And in this particular institution, if the patient is at risk for falling, they get a one-to-one -one nurse. Bingo, one-to-one -one nurse. Who was his one-to-one -one nurse? I was. Well. He did and he didn't. So I got to be his one-to-one. -one. That was terrific. Learned a lot about him, you know, and I could see how easily this gentleman would fall, how easily it was for people to overlook his capacity in light of his, um, his uh, underlying symptoms. But it was very clear throughout his entire narrative that day that he didn't want additional care. So in comes the first stretcher and team where they said, we're here to get um, Mr. Lee his, his um, central line. And I said, he doesn't want a central line. He's not going to do a central line because he doesn't want to go to the surgery so he doesn't need a central line. I said, please write down that he refused his central line. My name is Fulmer, F-U-L-M-E-R. Okay. So they look at me, they leave, and, and next in is the, is the first team of surgeons doing their job. Mr. Lee, do you understand what's going to happen to you if you don't get that line? Do you know you're going to suffer and be in incredible pain? if you don't follow through with this care. Now, what is their job at that moment? Their job is to keep the OR schedule on time. And their job is to make sure that that resident or intern gets their patient to the attending surgeon on time. And I said, he's not gonna have surgery because he doesn't want it. And he's decided he doesn't want a central line, so he's not gonna come with you today. In comes the 13. Now they say, you know you're gonna die, don't you? These are not bad people. These are not, they believe they're doing the right thing. They, and, and we're gonna talk about assessment in a minute. They believe they're doing the right thing and that that is how they need to advance quality of care for older people. And so, I said he's not going, he's, he, he doesn't wanna go, Fulmer, F-U-L-M-E-R. <laughs> so, so um, you know, uh, in comes an attending who says to Mr. Lee, I understand you don't wanna have surgery. He says, no I don't, he says, you know, what will happen? He goes, yeah, he says, okay, I understand. Calls palliative care, who in fact had been called the day before. So palliative care did a consult, and this made my heart sing. I thought, oh, I've made a difference today in my work. This feels so great. I'm so happy. I went home. The next day I came and I said, is Mr. Lee discharged? They said, he cardiac arrested at midnight. They coded him, and he didn't make it. They coded him, and he didn't make it. We heard somebody say earlier that the document 
is somewhere in the ether. It's, it, it, you know, but where is the document? And what is the problem with the document? And what's the problem with the narrative at that moment? We're doing grand rounds on this person to have a debrief because it would be very easy for us to not talk about it. And I am all over this because it's hard to get a debriefing with the right people, but I know we can do it. So what are we talking about? So we're talking about, in this case, institutional neglect and abuse in, in a hospital setting. But what we know is that there are a lot of ways that miscommunication, misinformation, uh, this disalignment with, with the uh, care that the person wants, their preferences, um, convoluted by cognitive impairment and no family caregiver in the room, uh, just a nurse in the room. And nurses have a lot of authority and a lot of a power, not that they always use it, although they should, but they have a lot of capacity to make things happen. So let's talk about why I will work on this for the rest of my life. I have been an NIH-funded investigator. I study elder abuse and neglect, and usually I study elder abuse and neglect in emergency rooms because I do believe at a point of crisis you can screen, you can detect, and you can make a difference. I've also screened elder abuse and neglect in busy dental clinics, thanks to Mike Alfano over here from the NYU College of Dentistry, who agrees with me that every point of care is a moment to screen and intervene in elder abuse and neglect. And so we can do that. What, what Philip Marshall has reminded us is that uh, what we, if we're silent and if we don't use our clinical acumen and our voice, that this can be uh, set aside and you'll get that pinball that somebody talked about before and that all of us will not be doing what we could have done to make sure that somebody's care preferences were honored and that somebody did not go through such an assault of process. So I set that up for you as, as a narrative that's very recent. I will continue to do my work, which is to make sure that every point of care ha asks the question, are you, is there any elder abuse, or is there any harm in your life that you want to tell me about? Thank you very much. Oh, oh, okay. Last month, CNN issued a multi-part investigation on sexual assaults in nursing homes. The title of this investigation is Sick, Dying, and Raped in America's Nursing Homes. CNN reported that between 2013 and 2016, the federal government cited more than 1,000 nursing facilities out of 15,000 for mishandling or failing to prevent suspected cases of rape sexual assault, and sexual abuse of residents. This finding is obviously startling and horrifying, and we can be sure it's only the tip of the iceberg. But in some ways, what is even more disturbing is how the victims of abuse are treated and how the regulatory system fails to protect them. One part of the CNN investigation was a detailed look at a case in North Carolina. The story began with a 53-year-old resident who had had a massive stroke a dozen years before. In October 2015, she was assaulted by an aide. Finally, after two weeks, she got the nerve up to report what had happened. She told the DON, and the director of nursing told her the incident had never happened. It was in her mind. They called the police to the facility. They took the woman to a nearby hospital, and she was locked in the psychiatric ward for several days. In February 2016, a few months later, a nurse at the same facility called the police to report a rape. The next day, another resident called the police to report a sexual assault by the same aide at the same facility. So the police began to take this quite seriously. They remembered the woman who had been locked in the psych ward, and they eventually identified six women in three different facilities who had all been assaulted by the same man. The state had been informed of three of the complaints at the time, but it had, been, it had determined that all three complaints were unsubstantiated. Clearly, the regulatory system failed them. In these cases, residents aren't believed. They're called complainers, or their memories are unreliable, or they're confused. And probably most often, they never speak up in the first place. This particular aide is currently awaiting trial on two counts of rape. There's been no response from the administration to this CNN report. In another recent example, a worker at an Ohio nursing facility admitting admitted spraying cleaning fluid in a resident's eyes as a joke. 
The aide pleaded guilty in November 2016 to patient abuse, a misdemeanor. The judge sentenced the aide to six months in jail, but then suspended the sentence and ordered a year's probation instead. According to the plain dealer, the judge said this was the worker's first criminal offense, it was just a misdemeanor, and the resident wasn't seriously injured. How serious does the injury have to be in order for abuse to be treated seriously? We obviously would recognize that what CMN is reporting and the plain dealer are serious instances of abuse, and we don't deal effectively or seriously with these most obvious kinds of cases of abuse. But what about the more day-to-day -day problems that are not typically described as abuse? What about the overuse of antipsychotic medications? These drugs can, of course, be life-threatening when they're medically appropriate, but they're clearly not for everyone. As early as 2005, the Food and Drug Administration gave its highest warning level to the public for atypical antipsychotic drugs, a black box warning. The warning said that these drugs could literally kill people if their diagnosis was dementia. If they don't have a mental health diagnosis, they should not be getting these drugs. The FDA soon issued a similar warning for conventional antipsychotic drugs. Research studies before and since these FDA warnings document repeatedly the harm that antipsychotic drugs cause for residents who have dementia, residents for whom these drugs are totally inappropriate. Increased risks for falls and fractures, acute kidney injury, heart attacks, hospitalizations, death. At present, the American Geriatric Society says that antipsychotic drugs should be avoided for all older people, except in the most very, very limited circumstances. Despite the increasing and ever-increasing evidence of how harmful these drugs can be for nursing home residents for whom they're not appropriate, the Inspector General of HHS reported in 2011 that 14% of nursing home residents, more than 300,000 people, were given atypical antipsychotic drugs. That report didn't document all the antipsychotic drug use. It didn't talk about the conventional anti antipsychotic drugs like Halidol, but the number was startling, over 300,000 people. Many of the residents had dementia, but they didn't have any mental health diagnosis that could justify being given these drugs. The Inspector General himself was actually pretty outraged and issued a statement on his own saying, everybody should be outraged by this, we have to do something. And he pointed out that overprescription didn't occur just by chance. He said that pharmaceutical companies had promoted these drugs for off-label uses for people with dementia. And I would add to what he didn't say in his statement that we know many of these companies were sued under the False Claims Act for uh, off-label marketing and pay back hundreds of millions of dollars to the federal government. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services responded to the Inspector General's report and the subsequent Senate Aging Committee hearing by starting an initiative to reduce antipsychotic drugs. That initiative is now called the National Partnership to Improve Dementia Care in Nursing Homes. The most recent CMS data indicate that in the third quarter of 2013, the antipsychotic drug use had declined, and by a significant number, maybe 60,000 people. But there's still hundreds of thousands of people who are getting these drugs who shouldn't be. The other troubling part of inf uh, that we have been hearing recently is that facilities are taking actions to get around the initiative to reduce the use of antipsychotic drugs. So we have seen evidence in deficiency reports that pharmacists tell physicians this resident shouldn't be getting an antipsychotic unless the resident has a mental health diagnosis and the physicians have accommodated them and suddenly come up with a new mental health diagnosis for the resident. CMS told us just this month that the reported cases of schizophrenia in nursing homes has increased substantially and they're very troubled because as we all know schizophrenia is not a mental health condition that people develop for the first time at age 85 when they're in a nursing home. So part of the decline in antipsychotic drugs in residents that we're getting reported is that there's some gaming of the system. Uh, either facilities and physicians are creating diagnosis to make the use of the drug medically appropriate, or in other instances we know that other psychoactive medications are being substituted for antipsychotic drugs. In fact, there was a, a drug that is given for people who laugh too much or cry too much, and we know that I, it was a crazy drug, and yeah, we, we know that that drug uh, 
A reporter told us she accompanied the drug representative to the nursing home who said, I can't believe this in front of a New York Times reporter, would you really do this? Uh, you know, you can't, you can't give them antipsychotic drugs anymore, but we've got a new drug for you that you might want to start using. That was pretty astonishing. So for many years, we have treated inappropriate antipsychotic anti drug use as a regulatory issue, and it is. Since the mid-1990s, the federal government has had strict regulations on the use of antipsychotic drugs, uh, but these regulations are not enforced very well. The antipsychotic drug deficiencies we know from a project we did with CMS are cited as not very significant, and there's virtually no enforcement. So even though we have strong regulatory standards, they're not enforced. But last year, Judy Stein asked me whether I thought the misuse of antipsychotic drugs might be abuse. So I looked at the Administration on Aging's definition of abuse, and here's the definition of physical abuse. Inflicting physical pain or injury on a senior slapping, bruising, or restraining by physical or chemical means. So misuse of antipsychotic drugs for people who do not need them is restraining by chemical means, quite plainly a form of physical, uh, physical abuse. The misuse of antipsychotic drugs, though, is not an issue that can be looked at in isolation. When the government started its antipsychotic drug initiative six years ago, the Boston Globe got national data from CMS on the use of the drugs in every facility in the country. And Kay Lazar of the Globe reported in 2012 that there was a correlation between the inappropriate prescribing of antipsychotic drugs and nurse staffing levels. She reported, quote, a clear link between the rate of antipsychotic use in a nursing home and its staffing level. And she went on, homes that most often use these drugs for conditions not recommended by regulators had fewer, fewer registered nurses who direct care and nurse aides who provide most of the hands-on care. We know, and we've known for decades, that staffing levels in nursing homes are grossly inadequate. Almost 20 years ago, CMS published a four-volume report documenting that more than 90% of facilities didn't have sufficient staff to meet residents' needs or to prevent avoidable harm. The response of the administration, it was President George W. Bush, was that there wasn't enough evidence in this four-volume report that is used by countries all over the world. Wasn't enough evidence to do anything about staffing. And so we are left with the same staffing standards we've had since the nursing home reform law was passed in 1987. One registered nurse on the day shift, licensed nurses 24 hours a day, and other than that, sufficient staff to meet residents' needs. It's clearly not enough. There's legislation that was introduced by Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, and we heard from Kathy Herwitt uh, this morning, uh, to put a nurse in the nursing home bill that would require 24-hour registered nurse coverage. But that is uh, not about to be passed anytime soon, I'm afraid. So what all of this means to me is that we need to treat nursing home issues not only as regulatory issues calling for stricter and more effective enforcement of standards, but we also need to treat poor, poor care practices as what they also are, instances of elder abuse. Thank you. So I'm going to change um, a, a little bit to looking at the ways that government can diminish levels of care and that in, in that effect there will be a neglect of care which in, in and of itself is a form of elder abuse. Um, I want to preface this by saying that Judy and I were invited to give webinar, a series of webinars to patients of the ALS Association last spring. And um, the purpose of the webinars was to educate the patients on exactly what benefits they were entitled to under the home health care coverage laws of Medicare. Um, we knew that people were having difficulty accessing benefits, but we didn't know to the severe extent. Um, and so we do refer to this as a crisis in home health care because the, the feedback that we got from the patients is not only can we not get the level of care you say we should be able to get under the law, but the care that is available in the community is significantly reduced or completely unavailable to us. 
And so we started down a road to do, uh, uh, as we do in, in our shop, uh, a lot of investigation, a lot of reaching out, a lot of trying to understand, speaking with every CMS official we could possibly get our hands on. And, and, and here's where, where I want to take us today, is to just give you a sense of, of what the crisis is and what we are looking at doing as a strategic plan to try to address it. So we know that Medicare home health coverage laws are adequate to keep many people at home, as was Congress's intent when they created the home health care benefit. Where people want to be at home, people should be, um, have the resources in order to stay at home. But what we've discovered is that CMS home health payment and quality regulations and policies are discriminatory towards certain uh, members of the population. I'll go into more detail about what that discrimination is. Uh, access to home health care for chronic care has been drastically reduced, resulting in individuals who are at greater risk of neglect and abuse due to the inability to get adequate home health care. So Medicare coverage, home health coverage laws allow homebound, and when we talk about homebound, these are individuals who need assistance to leave their homes, and these are individuals who have medical needs to remain in their homes, to obtain the appropriate level of care, and importantly as well, to allow family, friends, and the community to carry on. Um, for example, to keep employment, because oftentimes we hear story after story of people who have to readjust their lives in order to, uh, to care for people at home because they have no other option, um, where legally they do have another option. So briefly, what is the legal coverage under Medicare? So Medicare home health care coverage includes six disciplines, skilled nursing, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language pathology, medical social services, and home health aides. Um, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here and everyone probably knows this, but there are no legal caps on those six disciplines with the exception that nursing and aides are generally limited to a combined 35 hours per week. But there's no duration of time limitation, so as long as a person meets the coverage criteria, they should be able to obtain these services um, well into the future. So I want to introduce you to two examples of home health beneficiaries. Mr. B has Parkinson's disease. He needs long-term care. And his plan of care at home includes a nursing visit for one hour a week, physical therapy for three hours a week, occupational therapy, two hours a month, and an aid to do personal care, 28 hours a week. That's Mr. B. He has long-term care needs. Ms. K had a knee replacement and needs six weeks of care. And her plan of care is for physical therapy, three hours a week for six weeks, and an aid to assist with her bathing for five hours a week. So those are our two beneficiaries. This is the crisis in access to home health care. Agencies want to provide care to Ms. K and not to Mr. B. They want to provide short-term care to people who are going to improve, not to a long-term care person who has uh, a chronic extensive needs. And agencies may choose whom to serve and when to discharge under the Medicare conditions of participation. So this is in, the conditions of participation are not conditions to participate as a licensed Medicare agency. They are conditions of participation once you accept a patient into your care. Uh, I think there's a, a bit of a misnomer, misnomer in the world about that, but that's, that's the reality of it, that the home health agencies can pick and choose to whom they provide care. There's a higher profit margin for Ms. K, a loss for Mr. B, and the home health agencies have figured this out. There's a positive quality rating for Ms. K, a negative quality rating for Mr. B. 
Those of you who know about the quality measurement standards under Medicare know that there are six um, measurements under the value-based purchasing program. And of those six, five of them address improvement, improvement in ambulation, improvement in bathing, and because Mr. B is either not going to improve, um, we're fortunate if the care that he gets is able to keep him uh, with the quality of life that he has. Uh, but clearly, Mr. Ms. K, who is going to go from uh, a knee replacement to complete independence in six weeks, is going to improve. Uh, then the quality ratings that the home health agencies can receive are much higher for Ms. K, a short-term uh, acute care patient. Um, and again, there are value-based incentive payments for Ms. K, penalties for Mr. B. Um, and those of you who follow value-based incentive payments know that over the next several years, those value-based incentive payments are supposed to increase from what will next year be 3% to 8% in 2020. So we're going in the wrong direction. Also, Mr. B is more likely to trigger an agency fraud audit. Um, and I do want to make uh, just one kind of comment about fraud audits because we've had agencies that call us and say, we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to help people who need us. And CMS is telling us that, that if we serve someone for more than 60 days, we're going to be under a fraud audit. Um, and, and I would posture that the irony that fraud investigations are triggered by too many services provided. Oftentimes, CMS is screening to see, are you providing too many services? Well, the reality is that the fraud is actually based on too little services provided. Because home health agencies get a prospective payment, bundled payment, uh, under the system. And they take the payment and, and oftentimes deliver less care and uh, you know, it, it's, it's something that they say, we can't afford to deliver the care in the plan of care. So we'll either deliver to the level that we decide through the OASIS assessment, which again is to a certain extent something in the control of the home health agencies. Uh, but it's a problem that we see over and over again. So, so in, the, in that essence, um, it, it, it appears that the fraud investigations are targeting the patient's use of services rather than the provider's uh, lack of provision of services. So again, let's look at what typically happens. If a home health agency will provide care to Mr. B at all, he will likely have to settle for significantly diminished services. And this is an actual example where the plan of care from the doctor, as we went through earlier, um, had these different services. But as you can look across the, um, the numbers there, uh, the home health agency declared that their care capacity or their ability to provide care uh, went from, well, it's almost like a negotiation. Um, instead of the, the, the plan of care being one hour a week, well, we can give you one hour of nursing a month. Um, instead of physical therapy being the need, where the need is defined as three hours a week, well, well we can only provide you with one hour a week. Uh, occupational therapy, uh, well, you wanted two hours a month, but really we can only give you one hour a month. And the home health aid is, is often drastically reduced. Um, and, and Medicare will tell you, well, you know, that bundled payment really doesn't, doesn't account for unskilled services. So there's, there's very little incentive on the part of the home health agency to provide, uh, to provide unskilled services. So, but, but what happens is that Mr. B will look at this and say, well, you know what, I'll tell you what, it's better than nothing at all. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna be grateful for it because CMS will tell us over and over and over again, everyone loves the Medicare home health care benefit when they can get it and when, whatever level they get, they're happy with because it's better than nothing. So what is the injustice that's resulting from this? Uh, the injustice is that Mr. B cannot get the care he needs, or he can only get a reduced amount of care. And Mr. B's inability to obtain benefits covered by law is truly neglect and abuse that's perpetrated by the government payment and quality regulations and policies. So this is our strategic plan in trying to obtain 
justice for the Mr. B's in the world. And I will also say, you know, when we talk about who is Mr. B, Mr. B may have a, he has Parkinson's, but Mr. B may have a permanent injury, stroke, um, MS, ALS, cerebral palsy, he may be a diabetic, he may have Alzheimer's or dementia, he may have spinal cord injuries. There are a lot of Mr. B's out there. There are a lot of Mr. B's out there. So justice for Mr. B to obtain Medicare home health care coverage. Um, CMS has to correct all their misleading public materials. We have a list that's running multiple pages, um, and we've asked CMS to address this because it clearly they are um, there are misleading materials that say, well, Medicare doesn't cover long-term care. Medicare doesn't cover uh, personal care hours. Uh, and, and so part of this is um, it's right there. It's contrary to statute, and, and let's get these issues fixed. Uh, CMS has to conduct Medicare contractor and home health agency trainings on proper legal coverage. Uh, Judy and I go to conferences and, and talk to people where the administrative, um, uh, the Medicare administrative contractors are, and they will look you right in the face and say, no, Medicare doesn't cover uh, this part of home health care, and you can only get it for a very short period of time, and we don't cover personal care hours. Um, so part of it is the, the training that's trickling down through the system. Um, one of the things that I didn't put up here, which is the, kind of the most important thing, is CMS has to correct the trajectory of their payment and quality regulations because they are contrary to statute and they are uh, the, the, the distinction between the statute of coverage and the actual delivery is, uh, is growing, the divide is growing deeper. Um, Congress has to request that CMS properly effectuate the coverage laws and rules that provide Mr. B benefits. So this is if, if we can't get CMS to do what they should be doing, then um, we need to have our lawmakers aware that the laws that they created are not being uh, effectuated properly. And, uh, and, and the other part of that is looking at either an, uh, uh, something related to the, uh, the administrative um, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the, the laws that will perpetrate the ability of uh, CMS to do this through uh, the courts compelling CMS to change regulations and policies to equally incent agencies to provide care um, for all who qualify for coverage. And, and there are a few other ways that we can look at this, but, but it, it, to the extent that we have to pull out all the tools in the toolbox and use every branch of government to help to resolve this issue. Um, somebody said to us, well, maybe if you shake the tree too hard, what will end up is that the coverage laws will be reduced. Um, I think in the, in the climate that we have today uh, with people who are advocating for this benefit, we don't see that happening. Um, it could be that we need to uh, have a civil rights complaint. Um, that may be an, uh, a, a, an avenue that we'll go. And uh, again, the courts would be, as they always are with, what, with the work that we do, the last resort. But, but to have the ability to show how serious we are and, and that this um, amount of neglect through the lack of access to home care has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Is everybody fired up after hearing these presentations? Are you pissed off? <laughs> okay, just wondering. So it's interesting, um, when I was trying to come up with a title for this um, part of the presentation, it, it, it harkens back to me what Amy was talking about, is actually asking the person what they want from the care that we're supposed to be getting. It's a revolutionary idea, isn't it? But it's sort of the heart of everything that we're talking about. And getting it. <laughs> and when they want it, <laughs> to actually get it. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about behavioral interventions because it is the counter to the common conversation that you hear that there's nothing you can do for dementia. There's no treatment. It's just not true. Um, and I always put this slide in my presentation to give you a sense of how many people we're talking about. You guys know that. 
they're in the skilled nursing facilities. They're the majority of the older people that we're dealing with. I was talking to Mary. The majority of her clients that she's seen are dementia uh, folks. Um, and the numbers are just going to get larger. So it's really, we're having trouble figuring this out now for the 5 million people who have it. We have to get better because more people are coming our way. So when we talk about the behavioral symptoms of dementia, I want to really let you all know what we're talking about because people who think about dementia, they understand, oh, it's a cognitive impairment. But some of the most challenging dimensions of this disease are the behavioral and psychological problems that underpin it. And the struggles that we have in dealing with it are largely the behavioral issues. They're depression, their psychosis, agitation, aggression, the inappropriate behaviors. And it makes it so difficult for the people who are trying to care for folks with dementia. And those are the reasons that we have such poor outcomes when we're trying to deal with dementia is because these are the reasons people get institutionalized, right? It's the reason that caregiver burden is so great and that so many people have um, struggles with uh, financial issues when it comes to, uh, in, in they become incapacitated. Um, and so many of these things are caused by unmet needs of the people who are struggling with this disease. Lots of times it has to do with underlying pain or boredom or inability to have purpose in life any longer. So we're struggling with the unmet needs. And to me, these are fundamentally issues of justice, dealing with the the needs of the individuals in front of you, either who you're caring for as a family caregiver or because you're a health care provider, these are the issues that are in front of you. So w when I looked, as, as you talked about, when I, I looked at Philip's uh, video before coming here, so what is the heart of the injustice? We're not just talking about like behavioral issues. The heart of what happens is when people suffer from these issues, they're having unnecessary accidents at home. They're, f they're burning themselves. They're causing uh, physical injury to themselves uh, because they're having accidents. They're, um, it, may, it may be that it takes a long time for people to notice what's happening. And it's really challenging for people often to distinguish the differences between normal cognitive aging and dementia. And so it takes a long time for people to reach out to people who are struggling with this disease. And you, you're you wondering how long do people have to go through this injustice of not getting their needs met, and how long until we can get appropriate treatment. It takes the finances in shambles, like we saw with, with Brooke Astor, where people wipe out their entire life savings because they're victims of fraud. Doctors are unwilling to give a diagnosis. You present in the healthcare system, you're looking for help, and doctors are not giving you these diagnoses. And shockingly, and maybe not so shockingly, based on Amy's statistics of earlier of how many doctors are lying to you, flat out 11% they're admitting they're lying and 55% give rosy diagnosis. And I have to say that my heart goes out to physicians because they are not trained to understand that there are effective treatments that are available or to help people live a quality of life while they might live with this disease for 20 years. And so what happens is people are suffering the injustice of going to the emergency room or going to hospitals and they're getting slammed with all of these medications which are harming them. So there's tremendous amount of injustice going on. So what needs to change? We need good care to begin with early and accurate diagnosis. And it's very easy for the healthcare system and individuals to dismiss what's happening to older people just as, oh, it's just a normal consequence of aging. It's not. <laughs> and although I agree with many things that Philip says, when he was going through that lovely rhetorical point about 
what's normal and what's not. So many of those things are not normal. It's not normal to have all of the loss of your cognitive functioning as you age. That's a disease that needs to be addressed. And people need to have what is coming before them laid out for them and having caregivers and care recipients need the education and support they need to understand what they can do to improve the quality of their life. So we have a few challenges to address. This idea that there are no treatments available to family caregivers or in clinical settings is garbage and that needs to change. Psychotropics are virtually the only tool either in home health care settings or in nursing facilities that are given to most people who have this diagnosis. And it's the physicians and the nurses and the social workers who don't have adequate tools in place to help the people they're trying to help. It takes a lot more time to understand the underlying reasons a person is suffering from pain or these uh, behavioral issues than it does to write a prescription. And that's a fact in our burdened healthcare system that that needs to change. And then people need to be given what are the strategies to use and when to use them. So let's talk a little bit about what those strategies might look like. So it's the problem solving skills to manage these behaviors finding activities that matter to the person who you're living with and engaging with them, to find ways that when your capacities to communicate are diminished, that there's an ability to effectively communicate what your wants and needs are when you have dementia. And you have to change the environment in which you operate in order to meet a person where they are, to change the environment so they can operate effectively in that environment and to help simplify and create those structures which enable you to live as fully as possible. These lifestyle interventions are frankly things like exercise, diet, stress reduction, social engagement, cognitive engagement. The same things that keep you well as you age are the exact same things that help you improve your quality of life with you when you have dementia. There are new models of care that are being developed and it's fundamentally integrating the health system with the social supports that are already available in the community. And these collaborative care models are making tremendous advances. They're improving people's satisfaction. People are more satisfied with care and they are less likely to need these drugs that are harmful to them. So in some examples of some promising research that we have to figure out how to translate and scale up into daily practice, um, University of Michigan and Johns Hopkins have developed a platform which gives caregivers st strategies for dealing with all of these challenging behaviors so that we'll be able to get the information to the people when they need it like how do I deal with this constant questions? How do I deal with the, all the agitation and the arguing? What are some effective behavioral interventions that I can engage in so that my loved one is living better and I can continue to care for them where I am? Indiana is a fabulous example, NIH-sponsored work, and oh please, let's not cut NIH. <laughs> And the geriatric workforce programs, which are the only programs that are out there who are supporting <coughs> these kinds of programs for people. UCLA is another example where they've been able to um, take, uh, it's a CMMI grant that funded these interventions where uh, nurses, social workers are uh, able to consult with people who are living with dementia and you're getting consulting services and guess what? We're getting decreased hospitalization and overall Medicare cost savings when we implement these practices. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about what the healthcare system could do because here we are actually at the Center for Medicare Advocacy talking about payment and uh, 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 healthcare provision but I also wanted to talk to you because Philip fired me up with what can you do, what can our communities do 
to effectively help these issues. And so I want to mention the Dementia Friendly America Initiative, where multi-sector collaboration on a mission to foster dementia-friendly communities. So we're tr that is aiming at trying to help dementia sufferers and people living with dementia and their caregivers who feel isolated and cut off from their community actually maintain and be part of their community. Since the White House Conference on Aging, when it was announced that the Dementia Friendly Initiative was going to, to take off, 80 communities across 30 states have pledged to become dementia friendly and are striving and making progress in that area. So there's a huge fear and stigma associated with dementia and people, it, it's what makes people so vulnerable and subject to abuse. If you can bring that out of the shadows and you can have people understand there are things that you as a banker, you as a lawyer, you as a faith community can do, you are enabling and empowering that person to live in their community and stay with their family as long as possible. So Dementia Friendly America gives tools to each of these sectors and say, here's what you can do. Here are the things that you can implement to make a difference for the people that you're engaging with. I can't tell you how many people who have dementia get on a bus, get confused, get arrested, get thrown into jail, all because they've got dementia. <laughs> and the amount of time and resources that get wasted in that area, that's an injustice. It's an injustice for the people who are suffering through it. It's an injustice for the taxpayers who are paying for the most expensive and worst possible care. That's something that we can fix. And Dementia Friendly America is um, one of the ways that we can do it. Now, I know that I'm running short of time, so I'm going to say you can go to their fabulous website. I'm happy to talk to you more about the steps that your community can take to become dementia friendly. Um, but suffice it to say, I want to go at, on the individual level. Um, we've talked about health, what healthcare providers can do differently, what the community can do differently. Dementia Friends is part of something that uh, the Alzheimer's Society in, in the UK started. It's to help break down the stigma associated with uh, dementia and the fear of, of it. The idea is to change the way people think and talk and act when they're confronted with what dementia is. So it's pretty simple and it's something that everybody here in this room can do. You can look at a video training so that you can understand what are the signs and the symptoms. It's a really good way to begin to tell the difference between what's normal cognitive aging, what's the difference between just getting old and having this disease. And then they inspire you to turn this information, this education that you're getting into action. And it can be really simple action like being with a person who has dementia helping them with their social engagement. It could be telling others about uh, the dementia-friendly initiatives. Um, there are four states which have programs currently uh, that are supporting de dementia friends. And it's Minnesota, Connecticut, Maryland, bless you, and Massachusetts. Um, but there should be some other states that are ready to step up for that. And so if it's not happening in your state, or if you didn't know about it in your state, because we've got a lot of people from Maryland, Connecticut, and Massachusetts here, you can find more about it by going to the Dementia Friendly website. Thank you. Um, and let's try to work on some of these injustices. There's nobody better than this room to do that. So I feel empowered by it, and I hope that you all do and we'll figure out how we're going to sue all these bastards. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Well, we hope to have a discussion, but um, as, as want with uh, folks that have a lot to say, 
Um, I think that we are up against it. So we'll, um, we're, we're available. Thank you so much to the panel. This has been fantastic. And um, we're available to have a conversation, hope to keep having the conversation. There's a lot more to say about this topic. And um, I'm going to let Philip have the last word. There was a signal moment when I decided to act to help my grandmother. And since then, now a decade ago, I thought deeply about what happens when it comes to bystander intervention, because we're all bystanders. And we can either stand by our elders or we can deny them and deny ourselves by not acting. And when it comes to bystander intervention, we first need attention because we are distracted in so many ways. And then one of the most important issues when it comes to elder justice is awareness or advocacy. And advocacy is a public celebration of awareness, but awareness is personal. And awareness is an awareness that elders are both precious, but they may be compromised. And that awareness leads to acknowledgement and that acknowledgement is very deep and it's our personal acknowledgement of our obligation to our elders and to ourselves to act.